Um, so it was with absolute delight and honour to accept the invitation to reflect. Actually, I was asked just to talk about Suzanne, um, her clinical and clinical research legacy. But she's really endowed for the Melbourne, the Australian and the international HIV community. Now, as we heard, Suzanne started life as a registrar in 1984 at Fairfield Hospital. Um, there is a story about how she got into uh, Fairfield Hospital as a registrar, but I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> um, it is also um, interesting that uh, there are a number of people here in Gust, Allen Street, and Mitch, and Suzanne Crow. This was from the early days of Fairfield Hospital. And this week is Forbes Week. You heard about John Forbes. The um, Infectious Diseases Community has continued the tradition that was started at Fairfield Hospital in 1985. This was the first Forbes Week. Jim Curran was the um, guest. And again, Ian Gust, Suzanne, Beth Biggs, Alan Street, and Anne Mitch. Sadly, Alan Young and Ron Lucas are no longer with us. But Forbes Week continues 33 years later. Now, in October 1984, uh, Suzanne and Anne Mitch and Richard Doherty started the very first HIV clinic. It was held in an empty ward above Ward 6 at the periphery of the hospital. Um, on a Friday afternoon, not during the week, Friday afternoon, they used a homegrown HTLV3 antibody test, had a few false positives, but 25% of those first attendees in that clinic were HIV positive. And this clinic was the beginning of the holistic care and approach to people living with HIV that Fairfield became renowned for, that clinic. Suzanne was also the first, as Sharon has told us, to look at the CD4 cell count at which each of the opportunistic infections occurred. This was seminal, this was so important for the clinicians so that they could make rational decisions about diagnosis of opportunistic infections and the institution of prophylaxis for opportunistic infections. But we weren't too good at drawing graphs in those days. We didn't have the, um, the, the software that we have today. And that's the paper. Uh, Suzanne made enormous differences to patient care at Fairfield Hospital. She spent two years as the uh, Harkness Fellow in San Francisco, but then was persuaded to come back, was enticed to come back to the Burnett Institute. Now, I was told that it wasn't to start macrophage research. It was actually to start a reliable T-cell testing service because Ron Lucas was getting so frustrated with the results that he was getting from two different labs in Melbourne. One lab only gave a percent of CD4s and not a number, and the other lab seemed to have quite uh, different levels. And so he then started taking one set of blood, sending it to both labs and getting different results. So Suzanne just had to come back to start a reliable T-cell testing service. And she did that in her inimitable style. It was attention to detail, perfection, quality. Everything had to be right. So we had T-cell testing, which changed what we could do as clinicians for our patients. Later, she set up viral load testing in exactly the same way. Attention to detail, nausea accreditation, everything had to be perfect. <coughs> And both testing modalities were vital for our institution and monitoring of antiretroviral therapy for our patients. Now, what no one has mentioned today 
is what she did for us as clinicians through that her membership of ADEC, the Australian Drug Evaluation Committee. She held firm, strong advocacy, often as a lone voice, in the ADEC committee saying that you had to modify the criteria for licensing of life-saving drugs. And because of her strong advocacy, we got access much earlier to the AZT, DEI, some of the very early antiretroviral drugs that kept our patients alive until the more potent drugs came along. A very important contribution to the clinicians and the patients. So sadly, in 1996, Fairfield Hospital closed and the Victorian HIV service moved to the Alfred. And not long after that, although I hadn't realised it was four years later, the Burnett moved. Um, Suzanne was an incredibly respected clinician in the Alfred and she played many roles. She was on the Research and Ethics Committee, she was on numerous committees, um, too many to actually mention, medicine, the, um, the Evidence-Based Medicine Committee, etc. She also provided service to Monash University, the Victorian Government, the Department of Health, the Victorian Department of Health, the Federal Department of Health, Ministerial Advisory Committees, ADEC, and her advice for policy direction was second to none. A very important role. The other thing that we needed as clinicians in those early days was genotype testing, resistance testing, and Suzanne set up the resistance testing, genotype testing um, here at the Alfred, which gave the clinicians the ability to choose the most active antiretroviral regimen for their patients. But it was also at this time that Suzanne realised the importance and the value of having and stored plasma samples in a repository, in a, in a tissue bank. So the Victorian HIV Blood and Tissue Storage Bank was begun and became an, such an important repository for a generation of researchers and research studies. And there are very few places in the world that have such a specimen repository linked to a very extensive HIV clinical database which is also very important. Suzanne has played numerous roles for our patients. Another one. Many of our patients were in discordant relationships and wanted to have families. And so Suzanne and Anne Mitch, Penny Foster and colleagues at the Royal Women's Hospital set up an assisted reproduction program for discordant couples where one member of the couple was positive and the other was negative. To do this, we needed reliable, safe semen viral load testing. Very few labs would actually test semen for an HIV viral load, but Suzanne's lab did. They set up reliable testing, and since that program began, over 100 couples have been through the program, with over two-thirds taking a baby home which is not bad for any uh, assisted reproduction service in Melbourne. Suzanne is also a staunch patient advocate, constantly reminding us of human rights, delivering just and accessible care. For me, she was also, as others, um, one of the first true translational clinician researchers that I came across. She would notice something in the clinic, she would take it to the lab, she would work out what was going on and she would take the results back to the clinic. And in that way she's um, done a lot of work with, as others have talked about, with the HIV and um, pathogenesis with the macrophages and monocytes. But in my area, it's HIV and ageing, HIV and comorbidities that my patients are um, experiencing and it's Suzanne's work that is helping with that. Suzanne has had a lot of roles. She was on the executive of the Australasian Society for HIV Medicine for over a decade and was the president for two years. 
and also was convener of several conferences. And I've always liked being on the conference organising committee with Suzanne because we would have the meetings at her house with wine. It was terrific. And you can see Suzanne's glass of wine there. <laughs> Suzanne has also been a prolific editor and author. This is Alice Hussis, the first author of the use of antibiotics for the Bible for infectious diseases physicians. And in about 1994, I think, he asked um, Lindsay and Suzanne to join him. But then they found the workload was just a bit much, and so they asked me to join them. The workload was too much. I only lasted one edition of the use of antibiotics, the one that was actually um, published in 1997. But you can see that Suzanne's boundless energy has meant that she has been part of the sixth edition, 2010, and the seventh edition, 2018. I line them up at home. You can see they have actually doubled in size with each edition. So amazing effort. And John joined the uh, editorial committee for the last two editions. Also managed the HIV infected patient. Two editions of that, John, Suzanne and me, international authors made an enormous difference for uh, clinicians worldwide in managing the HIV um, epidemic and their patients. Suzanne is also an amazing teacher and mentor in the lab and in the clinic. She's had over 75 honours, PhD and postdoctoral research students. Uh, people haven't mentioned her chairing and membership of committees for the National Centre for HIV Virology and the National Centre for Clinical Research and Epidemiology, Epidemiology and Clinical Research, where in the latter she was part of designing the clinical trials the patients um, were invited to participate and in the former she ensured that the outcomes, viral load testing etc, were um, appropriate. We've heard about the TRAN, the TRAN program through the India, um, Australia India Council and Suzanne engaged bosses, clinicians, pharmacists, nurses to join her in many of these trips to India to deliver, to deliver very unique programs of education um, and as the larger cities were covered, they then moved to the smaller cities and the program was replicated in Laos, Myanmar and Papua New Guinea. So then has received recognition for um, her enormous contribution to clinical um, HIV medicine, both through an Order of Australia and through a profile in The Lancet. Um, however, just like Sharon, I chatted to a few people about Suzanne's legacy and there was a word that came up quite frequently and that word was generous. Suzanne and Robin O'Hare were generous with struggling medical students in medical school, helping them to pass. Suzanne was generous with friends when their house burnt down and they had no clothes, or when there was illness and friends needed help. She was generous sharing her extensive knowledge and experience. But there is another side that I've seen in the last few weeks, and that is Suzanne actually struggling to say goodbye. Saying goodbye to her patients, but her patients will really miss her kind, compassionate and considered care. Her colleagues will also miss that too. So good luck, Suzanne. Thank you. <laughs>